Hello and welcome back everyone. We have our very dear friend of the channel back with us, my dear monami, Xavier Al. Xavier, how are you my friend? It's great to have you back. It's been a quick two weeks or so since we last spoke. Yes, always wonderful to be here with you, Larry. Always a pleasure. Thank you for your invitation. Oh, thank you. It's quite late over here in the UK. I know you've had a busy day. I think you've had a couple of other interviews and you responded generously to me after I just messaged you today and here we are having a little chat. Uh, the reason I've obviously got in touch with you and for everyone to know, today of this recording is July 13th, 2024 and it's the anniversary of the Fatima apparition where Our Lady appeared from May to October in 1917 on the 13th day of each month. So the third month, the third apparition was July 13th, 1917, and that was the specific apparition, I believe, where she showed the children the reality of hell. They had the brief vision of the, the, the great fire, the souls, the demons, everything like that, with the vision of hell. And one thing that stood out for me, she never showed them heaven or purgatory, she just showed them hell. And the oldest of those three was Lucia, age 10. And I remember also in Fatima Xavier, they asked, inquired about a little girl who just died uh, previously in the past year or so before the apparitions. And Our Lady says that little girl would have been in purgatory until the end of time. It's very blunt messages, very hard, especially these days when you hear about all the wonderful peace and prayer and dear children, like such as Medjugorje or somewhere. Um, but she never mixed her words and she never held back the reality even to those little children who God chose to portray what he wanted to and now obviously a hundred or so years later we've learned so much about Fatima, the warnings about Russia, about the church and a few of those quotes I want to break into today as well. But before we do that, uh, since it's been the first time in the last couple of weeks we've spoken, since the big global live stream with Father Michelle Rodrigue and many other platforms around the world, how have things been? Because you and Monique have also set up the new channel as well. What's the feedback been like? To which you're a part of, by the way, always a, a permanent member. Thank it's you. been extraordinary. <laughs> it's been extraordinary, mon ami. Uh, we have received multitude um, of testimonies from France, from people from France, Canada, plenty in the United States and in the Spanish speaking world where thousands, thousands, there is one even particularly um, uh, Peruvian channel that has over 753,000 subscribers. According to him, he's received over a little over a million, a little over a million uh, text, emails, and um, um, post letters of people who said that since they've watched that uh, glorious and historical gathering, international gathering of podcasts uh, on the both sides of the Atlantic, they've been receiving um, countless testimonies of people who, for the first time in 20, 30 years, went back to church. People who decided after listening to Father Michel asked to see for the first time in decades a priest to hear their confession and return to God and go back to uh, dominical masses. In France, we've received the same thing. There was a gentleman in particular who um, I think um, my, my friend Cyril mentioned was a Freemason, decided to abandon his lodge after listening to Father Michel Rodrigue and left uh, the city of Rennes to go to Nantes, see an old friend of his who, used, who was a priest, who still was a priest, to ask him to receive him, to hear his confession and return to uh, to Mass, to the Catholic Church. Truly, the fruits of the tree so far in a matter of two weeks have been nothing short than extraordinary. And by the way, we had uh, one friend of mine who was absent, who was invited, Doug Berry from the G-Force, terrific chap. No? I spoke with him on the telephone and he told me, Xavier, I'm so sorry, there was a, a personal matter that uh, kept me uh, from... Uh, from going and attending, I wanted to be there, but I was recommended not to go for reasons that he asked me not to reveal. But he told me, quote unquote, on the telephone, I just want to tell you that I think um, Father Michel is a great lad 
a great chap. I totally support him. And um, whenever you want, we'll, uh, we'll discuss and we'll publish his public message. But I, I am in total support of uh, Father Michel Rodrigue. These are word for word, verbatim, what my friend Doug Berry told me on the telephone. So just want to tell him thank you for uh, the explanation, Doug. I trust you and uh, you're a good man. Yeah, he is. I enjoy watching his videos on US Grace Force as well as his own channel. And you know, for quite some time, I've been hoping and praying that he and I could talk sooner or later, especially on his own channel when it comes to the preparation stuff as well. So, Doug, if you're watching, please collaborate. <laughs> Great to hear from you. Uh, so, Zavi, I didn't, sorry. I didn't mention uh, you to him, I sent him an email. So I'll, uh, I'll try to push uh, a bit more. I know he's overwhelmed with work, but I will push him. He, I think it would do uh, him a great deal of good to expand uh, his personal show. He has one on the side, uh, beside that of with Father Helmeyer, but he has one on an independent one. So I will ask him to, to contact you. I will ask him again and see if indeed uh, you guys can get together and discuss, yeah. That'd be discussion. great. And for all you watching, if you watch both our channels, write in the comments what you'd like us to discuss, if you think it'd be worthwhile, and uh, please God it can happen. But back to the topic of today then, Xavier, I, I thought we've, we've covered so much with the prophecies this past year, with marie Julie Jaheni, La Salette, Garib and Dal, all fitting along the way with Akita. I thought Fatima been today's anniversary, maybe to get back over the seriousness, because as Pope Benedict said more or less back uh, just over 10 years ago, you know, those who think Fatima is in the past are very much deceiving themselves. Uh, so we have to pray ahead to advance the coming triumph of the Immaculate Heart. And with everything happening in the world right now, such as with Russia, as we know, is the main prophetic country. What about actually what's happening within the church? I've got a few slides thanks to our fr my friend Michael over in Garabandal, and I'm hoping to do some with him again soon. But I just wanted to pick a few of those slides up that I thought would be relevant to the discussion. The first one so, is... By the way, I yeah. do apologize for the sound of, uh, in the background. I have my gardener cutting our grass outside. I beg your pardon. <laughs> no, I can't hear too much anyway, don't worry. Uh, this first one, I hope you can see all right there. It was on the 11th of November 1984, then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger affirmed that the third secret of Fatima concerns a radical call for conversion, the absolute importance of history, the dangers threatening the faith and the life of the Christian and therefore of the world, and then the importance of the Novicimi, the last events at the end of time, but the things contained in the third secret correspond to what has been announced in scripture and are confirmed by many other Marian apparitions. So again, the context of many other apparitions, he himself being aware of them all from Fatima, Akita, and definitely Medjugorje. He gave the Garabandal a clean slate in 1992 as well. So he was very much aware of them and others. But that part, it gets to me... Not just a, it's a radical call, and I think Our Lady was very radical. Like I say, July 13th, 1917, she showed the children the reality of hell. Not putting off the fact of their age or the, the effect, but also the dangers threatening the faith. Where did we hear anything about that in the, 2000, the year 2000 announcement with Pope John Paul II at Fatima? But the fact that it threatens, the dangers are there threatening the faith, which leads to threatening the life of the Christian, and therefore of the world. There's a chain reaction if we go into an apostasy of faith. Would you say that's what it's kind of speaking about there? Where do you see the progression from these types of warnings from Fatima to now? What do you see the relevance of it, taking everything into context? That's a fair question. Unquestionably. Well, I think that uh, today, in view of what we know, that in view of the history events that have taken place before our eyes since 1917, 
we know for a certain fact that first and foremost the prophecies, the initial two secrets of La of uh, Fatima, which have, oh, by the way, have taken place, was a demonstration of the authenticity, a thumbprint of sorts, you could say, from of God's um, presence uh, through the messages brought forth, the prophecy brought forth to the children of um, Fatima, and later confirmed by the Garabandal, and 20 years later, yet again, or less than 20 years later, by Sister Agnes Sagawa. We mentioned, I think, before in uh, in a previous show uh, the one that we did together in your podcast, um, we told the story and the anecdote how um, the apparitions of Akita, the dossier of the apparition case, has been approved formally by His Eminence Cardinal Ratzinger. And it all rounded up and orbited around the last message received uh, by Sister Sasagawa, actually once again on uh, the feast day, on the ho or rather on the anniversary of another uh, of the apparitions of Ali de Fatima, October 13th, 1973, the 56th anniversary of the last apparition thereof. And we know now that it was because of that public message, which is somewhat <laughs> sensationalist and catastrophic somewhat, that uh, Cardinal Ratzinger decided finally to declare Akita as being worthy of belief and to permit the cult to take place there. As he stated, the third secret of Fatima is indeed in that public message given by Our Lady to Sister Sasagawa on October 13th, 1973. What is uh, most alarming, I think, um, Mark, and you and I, I think we can see it from our respective position of the Atlantic, is that it appears, although with all our best efforts, yours certainly being one of them, ours and other podcasts, particularly all the captains of the podcast who participated in our international conference, we try ever so desperately to echo the urgent call to conversion that the that heaven through the blessed Virgin Mary is trying to bring forth to the attention of humanity. It's not enough. We're doing our best, but we're not um, numerous enough. And uh, as Father Michel read the last public message, you'll remember the one that was given on uh, the feast day of Our Lady of Perpetual Help. This uh, chain of uh, rosaries that was asked the, by the Virgin Mary was a success. It was able to uh, weaken the forces of the devil and detain somewhat the intensity of the events that are to come. But we know that it's happening nonetheless. And the events that are to come Ah, really, too ghastly to contemplate, but we know they're coming. Yeah. I, I just kind of find that I've kept a distance to certain platforms or people where it comes across that they're just constantly judging. They're just constantly judging every single thing that the Pope does, every single thing that any priest might do that's been caught in camera, you know, from being too friendly on the altar and too much... Laddie does, which fair enough, I think we could all cringe at when we see laser lights and clown masks. But I feel as if, like, anything the Pope does or says is constantly ridiculed or judged, which I wasn't always liking. But when I look at some of these old slides and then I see with my own eyes what's now happening, they're, they're foretelling what was going to happen. And that's where it kind of makes me sit back and think, well, this is where that radical call of conversion comes, and it's more important now than it was a hundred years ago when Our Lady asked us for that radical call of conversion. I'm starting to wonder if we're seeing this, de we're desensitised as the generations have went on, especially since the 1960s with the, the passions erupting, the morals declining, as she said, in Quito, Ecuador, pro pointing into the future of the mid 20th century, but then at the same time in the church with the Vatican too, and the 1960 deadline of the third secret of the consecration to Russia. So it all makes sense from that. But I just want to get a couple other little ones up on that note to see how it is actually still um, fitting here. 
I, I've got his name on the next page on the next slide, but this was the the priest that was the official archivist of the Fatima and of the Third Secret. Again, a repetition of certain things. Quote, it is therefore completely probable that the text makes concrete references to the crisis of faith within the church and to the negligence of the pastors themselves and the internal struggles in the very bosom of the church and of grave pastoral negligence of the upper hierarchy. In the period preceding the great triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, terrible things are to happen. These form the content of the third part of the secret. What are they? If in Portugal the dogma of the faith will always be preserved, it can be clearly deduced from that, from this that in other parts of the church these dogmas are going to become obscure or even lost altogether. What's happening? I don't know enough in terms of the church politics, and that's a deliberate thing, almost as it is maybe a lack of caring to the point. I'm too busy trying to focus on living the gospel, living the messages our ladies told us with prayer and fasting, etc. Because there's always so much bad stuff you can take before you need a break and a detox. And that's why I made that decision a while ago to watch to be careful who I watched, what I listened to all the time, going down the rabbit hole, making it saturate in the brain. But when you're hearing this from someone that clearly knows the third secret of Fatima, the crisis of faith, the negligence of the pastors, what's happening just before the triumph, are we going to see dogmas of the faith being changed in other parts of the world, but yet in Portugal the dogma of the faith will always be preserved, as Lucia Fatima says? Are we really close to that, do you think, in terms of what that might be? Do you have any doubt? We only have to look at the latest events that are taking place in the Catholic Church to realize that this is no longer a subject of conversation behind or around the coffee table. This is now in the news. Let's remember what Blessed Anne Emmerich used to say as well, that the Catholic Church she saw in her visions uh, was a false church that came from the ashes of uh, the old Roman Catholic Church that we know today. A church which will, which will never ever disappear and nor ever be taken by the devil as we were promised by Christ. But even Blessed Anne Emmerich said that the Catholic Church will come uh, to embrace the idealism, the ideology of the Protestant uh, um, Christian churches. We are starting to see again and again these um, latest uh, declarations of fiducius, uh, these, de these documents, fiducius supplicants, amoris Laetitia, uh, fratello tutti, uh, and so on and so forth, the Pachamama incident, uh, the list goes on and on and on. Doesn't show a continuity of the faith that has been promulgated, defended, broadcasted, and brought forth by uh, the predecessors of uh, Pope Francis, but rather it's more and more, so it appears, a new interpretation of the teachings of Christ that is being presented to us on a silver platter. We discussed this um, in, with the international uh, conference on the 27th, which by the way is still on YouTube, anyone can go and find, that, find it. Um, the Catholic Church is right now, whether we like it or not, is going through a series of uh, conflicts which portray, literally, a civil war within the Roman Catholic Church. The only good thing I would say that it appears today is that everyone's masks, and God knows that there were many, have finally fallen down. You know? There are nonetheless uh, some absolute truths that must continue to be respected. As long as the Holy Sacrament of the Catholic Church maintain their continuity, I'm referring to the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist, sacraments of confession, sacrament of baptism, and so on and so forth, and that the teachings and the Gospels are still being taught, we must, whether we agree with the politics of the Pope or not, we must continue to pray for Francis, for Pope Francis. We must continue to pray for the hierarchy and for them to be inspired by the Holy Spirit to return or, come, or 
maintain their path uh, dictated by by Christ by by God but let us not be mistaken no what we the church is going through today is a crisis of the likes I don't think anyone who is alive today has ever seen in their lifetime but we must maintain and, and I'll finish simply with this according to what father Michel's advice was on again on June the 27th which I think is very wise a very cool head uh, a certain sense of charity and not let fear or anguish uh, overtake us for those emotions are indeed the inspiration of the enemy not yeah. at all an inspiration from God yeah I agree with that and I don't have any fear uh, about it all at all I just want to know the truth and I want to make sure I'm pleasing to the Lord that's always my number one thing but I, I definitely feel in my heart of hearts that God is number one before everything, before public opinion, before my job, before anything or anyone. God has to be number one. And I've seen that progress over the last 20 years where I can say it without hesitation. Um, maybe back in before I was back and forth with the desire for God but attached to the world as such. I definitely see that progress. And Father Leon reminded us in one of his homilies I saw from Medjugorje on the sh live streams a couple of weeks ago. He quoted a message that I remember well. Um, it was quoting their lady saying, Those who pray do not fear the future. Those who fast do not fear evil. And uh, how true that is. But the reason I'm saying all this is because there's going to be great confusion, and many of these slides will point out from the seers or the mystics. There's going to be great confusion, and those who remain faithful to the true dogma, the true teaching of the of the Lord and the Church, we're going to be the few. And I'm thinking to myself now, without knowing everything, and not dwelling too much into the topic of what's happening with Archbishop Vigano, and um, all that he said or accused the Pope or others of. For one moment I thought he was speaking a lot of stuff I could relate to. Other times I'm thinking he's went too far and is he just a conspiracy theorist? If he wasn't the Archbishop, if he never had the experience of his place and positions in the church, if you took all the cassock and that off him and you heard an old man speaking the exact same words, would you give him the same amount of credit for what he said? And that's where I was starting to think. But then I see Mel Gibson came forward and says, he's the modern day St. Athanasius. He's the one standing against the crowd. And is that true? But when you start reading some of this stuff, it's like, wait a minute here. Maybe it is. And maybe it is. We have to become uncomfortable. We have to even doubt if this could really be this bad this true and then again it's like well the majority are going to go with it what does it take to challenge our comfort levels to really go against the grain and I just want to bring up this other slide on that note from Padre Pio it was a public um, admonition that was recorded let's see if I get it up here in 1963 Padre Pio mentioned Fatima in a public admonition to his spiritual sons amidst Vatican II. Due to the rampant injustice and abuse of power, we have reached a compromise with atheistic materialism, a denial of the rights of God. This is the punishment foretold at Fatima. All the priests who support the possibility of a dialogue with the negators of God and with the Luciferian powers of the world are mad, have lost their faith, no longer believe in the gospel. In so doing, they betray the word of God, because Christ came to bring an earth perpetual covenant only to men of heart, but did not join with the men thirsty for the power and dominion over the brothers. The flock is dispersed when the shepherds ally with the enemies of the truth of Christ, all the forms of power made deaf to the will of the authority of the heart of God are rapacious wolves that renew the passion of Christ and make the Madonna shed tears. 
Again, he's shown his admonition for the fact that they're open to dialogue within the gators of God and with Luciferian powers. So Vigano keeps speaking about the dark, the deep dark church and the deep state and the World Economic Forum and the fact that the Pope's going to the United Nations speaking for half an hour without bringing the word Jesus into it. You know, he goes to the G7 summit and he's speaking about you have to be careful with artificial intelligence. They're signing things over in the name of ecum ecumenism and in this Abrahamic religion, as we hear now with the Abu Dhabi agreement. And it all comes across nice. It all comes across good. And there is a joy when you can actually have a conversation with a Muslim or a Jew or someone of faith and I've always found it a, a joyful encounter to share, but never at the, the expense of denying my own faith. And I used to see sometimes the ecumenical side of the Catholics being the hosts. It's the lack of observance when it comes to going into the Catholic Church, people chatting, and it's like the Eucharist is there, where's the reverence? We should be witnessing that. But instead it just becomes a hall where mixed faiths or none are all being made and I never liked that but the thing that gets to me actually is like with all this ecumenical stuff, this dialogue why does it feel as if it's the church that's losing its identity and this time where everyone's fighting hard for identity rights it seems to be the Catholic Church is the one that's reducing it, diluting it I've spoke for a bit there, there's a lot, but what do you think? What's coming to mind? I think the Americans have a very good saying. If it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it is a duck. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all the quackers. Americans... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think that the Americans are very colourful uh, expressions. But look, it's, it's evident. I think we, and as far as Mel Gibson and also Jim Caviezel, supports mm -hmm. also Vigano. Uh, I think that what we are seeing is exactly what we've been foretold. Um, it's, it's a conflict. It's a transformation, little by little, carefully and methodically uh, calculated plan to adapt to the faithful, to accept a change which, if it were to be shown from one day to the other, would not be accepted. Uh, we are beginning to see it we had first uh, the acceptation, the acceptance of men of the likes of uh, Father James, Society of Jesus, a Jesuit, or the appointment, nothing less than in the third uh, highest position in the Vatican, in the, um, as the prefect of the congregation of the doctrine of the faith, of a man who is an arch defender of homosexuality uh, and homosexual uh, matrimony inside the church, and author of two books that are simply utterly obscene, no? We begin to see these things when, uh, when we saw the Pachamama under the pretense of pastoral um, good thinking and benevolent paternal uh, overlooking, overseeing. We begin to see it as well with uh, statements declared um, by fiduciary supplicants and the documents alike. Finally, even to put a, or to silence heaven, which has been, according to the likings and to the taste of many prelates within the Vatican, they're trying to silence heaven by stopping them from reproducing a message that is recurrent and repetitive, pointing fingers at doctrinal errors that are being spread around by the hierarchy. I'm referring to La Salette, which was extremely severe against the Catholic Church. I'm referring to La Fraude, to Tilly, to Akita. No. That being said, um, this is not an, a wrong observation on your part. Uh, it is simply a point of fact when as we see more and more division, not more and more unity. Mm -hmm. There is no consensus. And not, not just between a consensus or a division between one faction of Catholics and another. It is a faction and a division between an era and another. And yet the truth of God does not change with the fashions of men. It remains absolute in all the centuries. And yet now the faction, the divisions we see is with the teachings that this particular hierarchy in our time 
is teaching which completely and utterly contradicts the teachings of all the preceding uh, episcopates um, and um, papacies uh, since the beginning of the birth of the Catholic Church. So I totally agree with you. I think you're making a very lucid observation. It's simply, and as far as Mel Gibson and Jim Caviezel are concerned, all my sympathies lie with them. All, unconditionally. There is no malice in them, no interest, no misplaced pride. And very much unlike a lot of our colleagues in other podcasts, they do not play or pretend to be uh, Father René Laurentin wannabe. They remain observant in humility. And uh, when they see an injustice, they just declare it. So I support them. I continue to pray for Pope Francis, that the Spirit um, may guide him and the hierarchy. And I will continue to do so as long as the Holy Eucharist is not put in peril or the liturgy is not changed to something invalid. Yeah, that's the one I'm I've got my eyes at the side as I listen to you try to find that one, but there's so many slides here. <laughs> um, there was one that was speaking about how, you know, the religious communities and the mass would be restricted. Certain ones would be, you know, it would be within the church that they would be focused on certain religious orders, communities and things like that to oppress them. And again, we've been seeing that recently in recent years under this papacy, which again I'm noticing, and I'm not here being anti-Francis, I'm just literally seeing all that's been foretold, and it's come fresh to me again this week, although I've been aware of this, when you re-look really at it, it becomes quite fresh, because then you've got more to look at and say, oh wait, that did happen, this is happening right now, this is what they're talking about now, just like we were foretold. And I noticed the interview with Archbishop Vigano with a, another and another journalist, I think. It was a pre-recorded question and answer from different places. But the, the interviewer highlighted that the restrictions of the traditional Latin Mass came into effect on July 16th last year. Now, if that's true, straight away... July 16th, I know, we know is the feast day of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. She appeared in Garabandal as Our Lady of Mount Carmel, warning where many priests, bishops and cardinals were on the road to perdition. It was one mm -hmm. of the few appearances that during the miracle on October 13th, 1917 at Fatima. She came again as Our Lady of Mount Carmel, uh, partly during that time. So there's a significance as why from all her titles... She comes as Our Lady of Mount Carmel, warning about the the mass will be uh, oppressed, religious communities will be harassed, restrictions, liturgy changes, and now we're seeing all this happening, and it's the focus on the traditional Latin mass, which I've been to, I'm very much open to it, although I don't make it a consistent thing every Sunday, I was never brought up with it due to being born in the 80s. But for the few that I've been to, there is something very symbolic and peaceful and, and beautiful about it. At other times I feel as if it's more of a spectator, but people say that gets better as you get used to it, because then you can follow it more. So there's a bit of perseverance in my part. All I would say is, there's a bit in scripture where I forget what it is, but it was like, when all these things have been foretold come to pass, let them stand as testimony to the events that are happening. And I find this with the private revelations, the Marian apparitions and these prophecies. They're standing to test me to what I'm seeing in front of my eyes now. And I think anyone, those especially who love the church, can't deny what they're seeing and witnessing before them. And this is where we need that radical call to conversion, to keep praying for the Pope, for the hierarchy, as our Blessed Mother repeatedly tells us to. Because we are approaching that time of triumph, that era of peace, and it's going to get harder before it gets better. But I want to be one of the few that remain faithful, just like it's prophesied. I want to be the few. That means you need to go against the grain, the majority. How are you preparing for that, spiritually, mentally? Well, you know, I'm also a dad. So the way I prepare is the way I teach my children to prepare. And first of all, uh, 
now that we do this podcast, now that we organize these historical international um, conferences, it is not uh, at all to have uh, to make it a, what some Americans call clickbait, no? But it is indeed uh, uh, to invite everyone to prepare the way heaven for the messengers have asked us to prepare by trying, trying to uh, live our lives with the roots of our lives, the basis of our, of our lives rooted in the Holy Scriptures, in the teachings of the Gospels, the way Christ taught them through the four apostles uh, by leaving the sacraments, particularly confession on a monthly basis and of course uh, communion in a state of grace. But likewise, uh, to pray the Holy Rosary um, every day, or at least as often as possible. For me, the greatest challenge, um, to tell you the truth, Mark, and I, when I spoke with Father Michel, I shared that with him a few moments. I spoke with him possibly 20 minutes before we started uh, your show. The greatest uh, challenge that I, for one, face, um, and I thought I would be totally immune to it, because, first of all, from the height of my 55 years of life, uh, one learns to to establish what is important in life and what is not. But I am surprised to see myself sometimes uh, react, uh, being terribly disappointed in some people that I thought uh, were sincere and friends, all of a sudden uh, turn around and, and betray. No? Father Michel, I discussed this with Father Michel uh, earlier today, as I said, he told me that um, this morning when we had a podcast with uh, Mundo Catolico, a podcast that lasted over two hours, it was magnificent. One of the Mexican hosts asked Father Michel, well, Father, have you ever met by any chance St. Benedict? Since uh, we know that St. Benedict came forth, St. Benedict the Abbot, no? who brought forth the medal of St. Benedict. And Father Michel answered um, in a very sentimental manner. He said, yes, I met in person, uh, San Benedict, once when I was going through personal turmoil, uh, when I was um, feeling abandoned by those whom I thought also were my friends. And San Benedict appeared to me and, on, uh, and stuck his forehead against mine to console me and then told me, Michel, strength, uh, faith and perseverance. I think for me, those three words are describe very well what I'm trying to do to prepare. Yeah. as well it's wise <laughs> well there's one word there that stood out for me because i think it was last year at the new year we went to church and my wife says you know every new year i just pray in silence to the lord and see which word comes to me for the year she says you should try it so i did and uh, i was fine for a few minutes just in the peace of the beautiful big church that we, we go to and uh, the word that came to me quite bluntly and clearly was perseverance. And I look back, seminary and after seminary, ups and downs, the poor pity party attitude and <laughs> different things. And it's like, we have to persevere. And as someone I watched recently saying, you know, just a few years ago during the lockdowns and the pandemics, those who took the thing in the arm and those who didn't, you know, it wasn't the case of no jab, no job. You weren't allowed to go into restaurants so quickly and how everyone says, yeah, those who don't take it shouldn't be allowed to go into restaurants, shouldn't be allowed in public, have to be put elsewhere, away from us and all that. The fear was there, but the danger wasn't just about how people are out of control with fear. It was the fact that they were willing to take in a second way of society, just like that. And a lot of people relate it back to how things changed through the socialist government of Germany back in the 30s and 40s with the Nazis as well. You had second-class citizens just like that. And the other part of it wasn't just them who were saying do it. It was the so-called good people, the Christian people, the church-going people who sat back and allowed it and just accepted it. And what did we hear back then in the 40s? only thing it takes for evil to spread is for good people to sit back and do nothing. You know, and, and the reason I'm saying that is because if that's a warm-up to what's coming, people are going to be deceived very easily again. They're going to be herded like sheep, just like they were before. Where's the true shepherds? 
and that's what we need to pray. We, we really need to pray for the shepherds. And I just want to maybe in that note finish off the point. I don't know if you've seen yet again another very, very unique thing coming from Medjugorje. I was going to do a separate video on it as uh, Ivan was allowed to share one of the messages that he had privately. You know how Maria gives the monthly message uh, to the public and we just had this big worldwide global outreach for the Novena leading up to the anniversary. A friend in Medjugorje sent me this message during uh, the week of July 6th. It was the message from Our Lady to Ivan. Dear children, Today I want to call you in a special way to pray for my beloved children, for the priests, that they may preach the living word of the gospel in a simple way, that their path may be the path of holiness, that in this time they may give testimony as never before, that they may be carriers of my messages as never before, without fear, without fear. Thank you, dear children, for having responded also today. As she's like, without fear, without fear. I mean, she's re-emphasizing in words. You can, I don't know for all these different post, like apocalyptic messages from alleged seers all around the world, the gentleness that's always been there with Medjugorje messages, but even just that little repeat from that gentle thing that we perceive from Our Lady, it's still very clear it raises the eyebrows, I think. It's like, it's serious. We're getting there. You know, but um, the bridge to the triumph is imminent. That's what we need to hold on to. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And um, you're a good man, <laughs> Mark. I congratulate myself, and I don't mind saying this publicly. I congratulate myself to call myself your friend. You're a terrific chap. And uh, I'm grateful to the Providence that we came to know each other mm. and that uh, we became such good friends. Oh, I'm very happy with it. I just hope and pray that we meet in person very soon. That would be so great. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> I have a good scotch together. Well, I was in the middle of having one when you phoned late saying you want to do the video. <laughs> It's waiting for me. <laughs> I tell you what, you'll go, you'll give me a good bottle of the finest scotch that Scotland has ever produced, and I will bring you a beautiful bottle of Napoleon cognac. How does that oh. sound? See, that's how we create peace in the world. If everyone just did the same, we would have peace. <laughs> we show the example. <laughs> Absolutely. I know we've covered a couple of hot topics there, and. I just kind of felt like with a lot happening recently in the church and the world and to see some of this fresh, this stuff's over 60 years old pointing to these times and now we're seeing it. I don't go in to judge the Pope or the hierarchy, although we're warned against them and stuff is going to come, which right now we're seeing with this uh, current papacy and those are in positions right now. But as that message says, keep praying, keep praying like never before. And the fast and the power of fasting. So hopefully that's enough for people to kind of gather and keep calm as well as keeping vigilant like the watchmen and the towers, you know. But um, we keep going with what we see and we just keep growing in holiness. But if you want to take the final word, uh, Xavier, by all means, uh, it's up to you. You can finish with a prayer after. I simply would like to, um, to thank Divine Providence because in this sort of... Um, um activity this job which we have taken upon ourselves you know men like you mark uh have picked up a standard a banner that has fallen down you have come forth without fear of criticism and you are taking up the, the banner and i hold is you are holding it up high i only pray that i can join myself to you and maintain it high and we shall see the very best and the very worst. As far as I'm concerned, men and women like you are unquestionably the very best. And I pray that your viewers, and not for popularity's sake, I think your viewers are lucid enough to see in you, to hear in you the accent of uh, true devotion, true conviction. But I pray that they continue keeping an eye 
on your shores to be guided towards the and an interested truth towards the soul truth as a star of Bethlehem because what is coming is going to come very quickly and I believe that you will be able to present to your faithful uh, the true path to choose and as well I pray to all your viewers who watch us uh, at this moment to pray for you and your continuation in your mission and to your for your family your lovely lovely English wife for your home and if it's not an imposition as I always do I ask humbly for everyone to pray for me for my two little munchkins for my wife and my home and those that I love and I thank you Mark you truly are an, um, and if I didn't think so I would not say so but you are an exceptional person and uh, now a dear friend of mine what up yeah uh, and it's the exact same back to you mon ami i'm so grateful to the lord that he's put us together from opposite ends of the atlantic here we <laughs> are so please god we can definitely meet soon that would be great but Hi. until then this is the best we can do and uh hopefully we've got more to come with father michelle and and hopefully after that global outreach more people will be starting to get in touch to work and get out there as much as we can while we can uh, so for everyone as always thumbs up like subscribe and share because it really helps the algorithm to promote it all the more that's your little part and we know that's cast in the nets and before we forget Xavier you do have the new channel with Monique would you mind telling us what it's called again <laughs> That's very good of you. I didn't dare to mention it. I didn't want to make publicity. I forgot. Your <laughs> Sorry. You're... No, I am so grateful. I, I didn't dare to say anything. But yes, uh, Monique Tonbull, uh, with the support of her charming husband, uh, and I have mounted uh, this new channel called Oak Hooks Ave Media. And we've asked um, Mark to be a part of it. He works with us. Everything we do, we'll uh, inform him so that he can we can complement each other and work in utter collaboration. And uh, so you're all invited to join in. And everything we do, as I said, uh, we will include Mark as a mate of ours, a friend of ours, along with uh, Cyril, um, his counterpart from across the French channel in France. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Well, I, I can see it's grown very fast in just a couple of weeks. You're doing very well, as expected. So we look forward to doing more of that together for sure. But as always, everyone, the link will be in the description box below for Xavier and Monique's new channel. Cast those Thank nets, you. you know what you have to do. And until next time, take care and God bless you. Bye-bye.